and welcome to this session. I'm Anthony Dworkin. I'm a senior policy fellow here at ECFR. I'm not Vanilla Carlson, um, who was the appointed host of this session. Um, as you may have seen, um, Ganilla has been having some problems with her sound. We hope she will be able to rejoin us. In the meantime, I'm going to step in at short notice and do my best to share this interesting and very important and timely session. So the, the coronavirus crisis, I don't need to tell you, has already been the subject of a lot of our discussions today. Um, it's emerged as the biggest crisis facing Europe and facing the world in these last six months. And it's obviously going to be a central part of the German EU presidency, which is just beginning. So we're really delighted um, in discussing this subject to have two fantastic guests for this panel. Uh, we have Jens Spahn, the German health minister, and we have Mark Sussman, CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And during this um, session, we're going to be discussing the, the, the world's response and Europe's response to COVID-19. Um, of course, as is well known, the, the coronavirus is uh, it's a paradigm case of a global challenge, a health crisis that is incredibly infectious um, and that respects no borders. Um, and so it's something that the, the world must face together. And yet the response that we've seen in many people's eyes has shown up the problems of international cooperation. Um, it's also shown up the problems for Europe of trying to secure the, the safety, the security, the health of European citizens um, at, against the background of a competitive global order, um, where particularly the, the conflict between great powers, above all the United States and China, is making global cooperation impossible. So in this session, we're going to um, ask our two speakers to talk, uh, to give us their you know, very informed perspectives about how the response to the coronavirus is, um, you know, what it shows about European power, European ability to secure its interest in the world, and what it shows about um, the prospects for global cooperation. So we'll start, um, Jens Spahn, with you. Um, if I can ask you to give your sense you know, how, how can Europe, um, you know, going forward, try to protect itself better? Um, and what in the German presidency do you see as the priorities for dealing with this challenge? Thank you very much indeed. I, I hope you can hear me at least uh, after we had some uh, problems uh, to start. Uh, I, I think Gunilla will be there later, hopefully. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation, the possibility to uh, discuss and to give some uh, introductory uh, re remarks. Uh, first of all, because I get calls actually almost every day from colleagues all over the world, uh, uh, journalists, many others, asking actually how Germany so far at least uh, managed to get through this crisis so well. And what I always say is uh, that makes us humble and uh, grateful, not overconfident, um, because actually we had the chance pre to prepare because others have been hit uh, earlier. Uh, and that gave us the possibility, for example, to prepare ICU capacities to, uh, uh, we could build on uh, big lab capacities that we do tr traditionally have uh, in this country and that are very helpful from the beginning, for example, uh, uh, and with the health system covering all, it was possible to give, for example, tests to everyone that needed one from the beginning. So we had many circumstances that actually helped us through so far, uh, but what we have seen from the beginning is that can't be solved on the national level alone. Uh, it only can be solved together with others in Europe and on the world. Uh, and if it is about Europe's role in global health, 
uh, a big part of it is European health sovereignty. And that is what we want to make one of our main topics of the presidency that starts this week of Germany within the European uh, Union and the Council. Uh, European health sovereignty means, for example, that we should not be as depending as we are uh, on, on uh, other regions of the world, especially China, uh, when, when it comes to APIs, drugs or uh, medic, medical uh, devices or just uh, masks, for example, for healthcare workers. It should not be decided in China uh, whether we have masks for our uh, nurses in Amsterdam, Warsaw uh, or uh, Berlin. Berlin, uh, and that is why we want to uh, debate, actually, we started that already last year, by the way, before Corona, uh, debate a framework of how we can bring back production of certain goods uh, to Europe. It's not about ending globalization or uh, ending uh, free trade all over, uh, but it is about the right degree of globalization and uh, to define some certain areas where we should be sovereign and be able as a European Union uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, actually help ourselves with essential goods uh, when, uh, when needed. Um, that means uh, as well, uh, secondly, that we do have the, that we need to have the institutions to act uh, on a European level. We, for example, have the European Centre for Disease Control uh, and ECDC. By name, you could think Can the I CDC try? in the US. Yes, I hear you. Uh, but that's Gunilla, I assume. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I just uh, go on, Gunilla, if that is okay. Um, it's the European CDC, uh, and by, just by hearing the name, you could assume that it is similar to the American, the, the US CDC, but if you take the resources uh, and uh, uh, actually what they really can do, uh, it's far, far away from a real uh, US CDC. Uh, and what I want to debate, and we're going to start that on the 16th of July in our uh, informal council, in our informal council, is how we can strengthen uh, the ECDC uh, with resources, personal uh, and money, uh, but uh, with uh, uh, yeah, responsibilities and the possibility actually to, for example, uh, ask in a in a more uh, uh, when a straight away member states to deliver uh, data, that's the first starting point, for example, or to have a kind of task force that is able to uh, support uh, uh, European countries or perhaps even countries outside of Europe uh, in need. Uh, we, I, I once called it a health uh, NATO. Uh, we do have structures when it comes to uh, to uh, uh, other crises, financial crisis, for example, too. We do have structures and mechanisms in Europe. We have developed them uh, 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 in the past in the past years, uh, but we don't have uh, real structures for a health crisis. That is what we have seen. Uh, it's a pandemic, for example, but could be bioterrorism as well. Uh, and what we what we need to develop is institutions, and ECDC definitely is one uh, is a part of this institutions that can act in a crisis like this on a European level that do have the uh, the legal ground to act and that do have the resources to act. And that is what we want to uh, debate uh, and develop in the upcoming six months. By the way, as I said, not just for uh, help within Europe, the CDC. I remember very well when I was visiting Congo uh, to get a better impression of the Ebola crisis uh, on the ground. Uh, last September, the American CDC was very present with, with people down, uh, uh, down there uh, supporting uh, the whole, uh, 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 the whole uh, uh, project down there of the WHO. Uh, and what I could imagine is that we have a European CDC engaging outside of Europe too. And that brings me to my last point, uh, engagement in international organizations. And uh, just two regards. One is um, the no Prime Minister of Norway, the President of Ghana and our Chancellor Angela Merkel uh, have written a, a letter uh, to the United Nations and other international organizations to actually better cooperate when it comes to the SDG 3, the Sustainable Development Goal uh, uh, for Health. Uh, and that means that, we, I mean, we do have so many international organizations privately and publicly run uh, that en are engaged in, in, in public health and global health. And that is good. I mean, we just hear of Gavi, CP, WHO, 
a lot these days, UNAIDS, World Bank, many others. But it's important that they do it in a coordinated way, that not everyone does everything in every country, uh, but that there are clear structures within the engage uh, coordinated and that is what we have started to set up uh, there there was a starting point after months of uh, of discussion and, and working out the framework and now for the concrete work on the ground with the first countries uh, uh, doing the uh, uh, world assembly last uh, year uh, uh, in new york uh, and that is something we want to go on with and the second is the reform of the who i was just in geneva last uh, thursday with my french colleague uh, olivier Veron, uh, because in a time where you see that at least they are threatening that they might pull out the us uh, that others are about to pull out of the who and i would really regret if they did so uh, because they for, for decades actually have been the main contributor and supporter of the WHO, the United States, and of course it would be better to have them aboard uh, for the future. Uh, but nevertheless, what we need to make sure is that there is more European engagement within the WHO and not just uh, the engagement of the 27 member states, uh, everyone on its own, uh, but engagement together as a European Union within the WHO. And that is what we want to uh, shape uh, that we want to debate where the WHO, from our point of view, European point of view, needs uh, reforms when it comes to accountability, to structures, uh, to make debates less political in some uh, uh, committees and more technical, for example. Uh, lessons learned from the past uh, three, four months, uh, but lessons learned from the years from the previous years uh, uh, too. Uh, and that actually was a starting point with Olivier Veron and the French colleague and others uh, that within the next six months, we want to discuss the European uh, uh, role within WHO and other international organizations uh, in international health uh, to actually let have uh, Europe a bigger role, a more engaged role uh, in global health uh, for the future in times uh, where others uh, might be less engaged. Vielen Dank. Thank you so much. And again, apologies for this. It's uh, me and my Mac in the rural part of Sweden at the moment. So sorry for the technical disruption. Uh, Minister Spahn, uh, thank you. Uh, very interesting. And I think we also would hear a little bit more from Mark Sussman with this health sovereignty actually will mean for markets and access. Uh, we have already now a question for you, and I think it's appropriate to hand it over already from uh, Mr. Achim uh, Wiergaard in Hamburg. He is asking you a little bit about, as your experience as a minister, uh, what kind of competencies in health policies would you like to uh, see more of on the EU EU Commission, and uh, what would you be happy to transfer to Brussels? Well, that's a good question, and that is a debate that was already ongoing before this crisis, of course. And I find it very important, and you can imagine as a national health minister, I do, <laughs> indeed, uh, I really do, uh, that uh, we really define uh, on which level uh, which responsibility um, and on which level what is better solved. And there are certain areas where there is a European added value, where there is an added value if we act together. Uh, when it comes to research, fighting cancer, for example, uh, uh, rare diseases, uh, the research network we have, uh, set up when it comes to patient mobility in Europe, uh, of course, or as we see now in this pandemic, uh, when it comes to uh, 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 transmitted diseases, uh, vi virus or bacteria or whatever, uh, where the, the border is actually, uh, the, a virus knows no border, so there is no border in, in fighting this virus and should be none. Uh, and in all these areas, you see a European added value. And then at the same time, there is, um, there's always, you know, the, the health systems in Europe and all over the world, they're very much linked with the culture of a country, with the tradition, with history. Uh, take the NHS, it's kind of uh, 
kind of part of British culture, actually, uh, and that counts for, for, for most uh, health systems. So uh, when it comes to coverage, when it comes to financing of the health system and other, uh, other issues and areas, I would say that should remain on a, a national level uh, and that will uh, be necessary to actually to, to have real acceptance of people and, and citizens. So I would say let's define those areas where there is European added value, especially in the budget too, by the way, get out of this net uh, 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 who pays how much and how much are we getting out of the EU budget as soon as we have in working ECDC, as we have research programs for cancer, for example, uh, if, we, if we have structures to fight the pandemic, that is something where you can't say as a member state, uh, how much did I pay into the budget? How much do I get out? That is real added value, European common good. And we need to define these European common goods uh, and for that, I would always be willing to give some sovereignty to Brussels, if to the Commission or to uh, institutions that are run by the member states, that needs to be discussed, but still uh, uh, to European institutions. And then there are certain areas where I, uh, frankly spoken, uh, don't want anyone from outside to interfere. Thank you. And Mark? Welcome to this uh, session. We are so grateful that you are taking your time. ECFR has a very good collaboration with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We would like to congratulate you to becoming the new CEO. You have a long background in the foundation. You are a former journalist and you have served in United Nations with a very big knowledge base now. And here you're here, one of the leading health ministers of the world, to see how the European Union is really struggling, perhaps even harder due to the COVID crisis. We are really happy to hear your views. To um, uh, We will open up for questions a little bit later, but it would be very nice to hear your reactions to what the minister so elegantly put forward to us. Uh, and your take on what's happening in global health these days. Is the system working? And if not, what can we do about it? And what's the role of European Union? Welcome, the meeting room is yours. Great, well, thank you, Ganilla, and I hope everyone can, can hear me. And I'm very pleased that we were able to sort out your audio difficulties, and it's great to see you again. And thank you also, Minister, for uh, your contribution, but you know, as or more important for Germany's real leadership in recent weeks and months, including just over the weekend and what you were describing in terms of support to the WHO and the support to the um, access to uh, COVID tools accelerator, uh, which President von der Leyen of the European Commission has been a real leader on, but we've seen Chancellor Merkel and President Macron also deeply engaged along with uh, our foundation and many other partners. Uh, maybe if we take a couple of steps back and say global health security is something that uh, we've been discussing as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation with the European Commission and with many of the member states for several years. And in fact, uh, when Chancellor Merkel was hosting the G20 a few years ago, uh, she asked uh, my boss, Bill Gates, to uh, convene a special session, which was discussing the potential for global health security and pandemic preparation. And there have been steps taken in the wake of Ebola that, uh, again, where there's been significant European leadership from individual states and from the Commission the uh, creation of the Coalition uh, for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, CEPI, which is now playing a leading role in trying to find a vaccine, uh, has had significant European uh, support from an early stage. Uh, there have been a number of other actions as well, but I think we can all say safely it's fallen far short of what actually is needed now that we are confronting a true global health crisis in the form of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so certainly in the medium to long term, uh, we are very supportive of where the minister wants to go, saying we, we need a very different international machinery that is being thoughtful because there will be additional crises that is thoughtful about uh, wider surveillance that is doing support. For example, I think uh, you mentioned the potential support to the African uh, Centers for Disease Control. Uh, there, these are true global public goods in the real sense of the term. But uh, for right now, in terms of the current response, uh, we are facing divergent, um, if you like, streams in the global. Uh, at one level, it is clear that we simply will not have a solution. There are no national solutions without a global solution. Uh, people can't just lock down indefinitely 
and prevent uh, flow of people and others across borders. Uh, the solution needs to be global. The long-term solution clearly will have to be a vaccine, first and foremost, and when we have an effective vaccine, that will allow us to, quote, go back to normal. Uh, but in the meantime, there are important steps we can take. There are treatments, there are diagnostics, there are the preventive tools where Germany has been a leader uh, in, in terms of rolling out guidelines. And so how we balance that response uh, is exactly the dilemma we're facing now. Clearly, the United States, uh, which traditionally has played a much bigger role in this, and, and over the last 20 years has been far and away uh, the single uh, biggest bilateral contributor to global health, is not currently playing that role. Uh, we hope that uh, may change again in the future. We're in ongoing discussions with the United States government, but it's clear that is not a current priority of the Trump administration. In that context, the European Commission has really stepped into that gap, that the hosting of the Act A accelerator uh, that I mentioned uh, by President von der Leyen with European leadership and now with two funding commitments, the most recent over the weekend, has raised nearly $15 billion uh, towards wider global COVID response. And we've been a key uh, partner there too, along with the Wellcome Trust and other philanthropic organizations. But it's still far short of need, total need across the diagnostics, therapeutics, and the vaccine, uh, probably is in the order of around $80 billion over the next 18 months uh, to 24 months. And that's a big number, but it's a very small number relative to the trillions of dollars of economic damage that has already taken place. And if we can accelerate this kind of, uh, sort of response, even by a month or two, uh, the economic impact of that far exceeds uh, the costs. But it's still challenging. Um, and there we are really counting on, on European. I think we have seen a real shift of both you know, European core expertise and, and European soft power, frankly, leaning in and being the convener, uh, you know, convening in the president of the African Union, uh, President Ramaphosa of South Africa, or the uh, current secretary at the uh, chair of the G20, the Saudi Arabians, who came in and, and frankly, providing platforms, the original thing, had both uh, the US and China uh, participating in a European-led event. Uh, President Trump participated and uh, Premier Li Keqing participated. Now, they participated smaller, but there's still, it's an important symbolic uh, moment of where how European leadership can provide a necessary global platform going forward. And I think it is European leadership, both supporting stronger national and uh, European institutions like the European CDC and initiatives that the minister talked about. And it's also about European leadership in these global multilaterals like the World Health Organization, like the Gavi Vaccine Alliance, which just had a very successful replenishment again with significant European support, uh, like CEPI that I've mentioned as well. And so uh, while it's great to have had the leadership we've seen so far, Frankly, much more is going to be needed, and I think Europe is going to be absolutely essential uh, to meet the current challenge. Thank you so much, Mark, and, and uh, we will open up soon for questions, but I would like to just have the opportunity to, to ask you to reflect a little bit about um, what the Minister mentioned about uh, health sovereignty and what you think, as Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are funding a lot of vaccines and if we are uh, is there a risk of a distorting market shaping and also uh, when it comes to multilateral solutions you might both of you uh, address this issue because it's it's highly interesting and also um, what minister uh, jens barn mentioned about um, the who and europe as a convening partner but can europe also do more when it comes to restore multilateralism and and be really not only be a convening power, but to do more together to help reforming WHO. And how do you see this in this period of time? Uh, I, I suggest we ask Mark first to comment a little bit, if you don't mind, on health sovereignty, and then let uh, uh, Minister Jens Spahn continue. Yes, absolutely. So there's a lot of discussion at the moment about vaccine nationalism. And what you have is a lot of uh, national efforts. The United States has been foremost among them, but we've seen them uh, in the United Kingdom, in Germany, frankly, and in, in uh, a number of other countries that are trying to make purchases and things to sort out and ensure that there's going to be sufficient supply of potential vaccines coming down the pipeline for their national populations. 
that's a legitimate uh, goal. In fact, it's it's the primary responsibility of governments is to look after their citizens. Uh, but our concern is that uh, in the current context, it, it can be a short-sighted one, that really what we need is bigger multilateral mechanisms that will both um, diffuse risk so that we don't know which vaccine products are going to uh, be successful. We happen to invest in in uh, most of them directly or indirectly or engage with many of the partners but we don't know if it's going to be an american vaccine or a french vaccine or a german vaccine or a british vaccine uh and we frankly don't care we just want a vaccine hopefully multiple vaccines and we want to produce as effectively and efficiently as possible we want all the safety protocols to be committed and then we want it distributed you know at cost globally uh, as quickly and efficiently as possible but that's going to require billions of doses and uh, it's going to require a number of these candidates will probably fail in the short term. And so efforts like the Act A Accelerator that Europe has been leading on, uh, efforts like uh, the CEPI uh, are just so essential, both in the short and the long term, uh, to ensure that when we have a solution, it's really going to be one that can be uh, globally uh, rolled out as quickly and effectively as possible. And the second point you raise in terms of is there a greater role for Europe into the wider multilateral machinery and and I mean, Ms. Ben talked about uh, the World Health Organization. You know, we are currently the second largest funders of the World Health Organization after the United States and if the United States follows through with its threat uh, we would become the largest which is not something we would like to do and it's very strange to be honest that a private philanthropic organization should be uh, in that position and Sometimes it says, well, does that make us disproportionately influential? And I would argue, no, it, it highlights the disproportionate underfunding of the global health machinery. Uh, if the World Health Organization was funded and equipped at the level it should be and could be and the global multilateral health machinery was funded, then uh, we would already be addressing the current crisis uh, more effectively. That WHO has many challenges. We work closely with them, but a lot of them is about sort of resourcing and structure. It's not simply reform for reform's sake, it's, it will need to be properly resourced and supported reform. And again, here, European leadership will be absolutely critical. Thank you, Minister Spahn. And can I also add a question from our chat box to you? Because it's also about health technology from Gillian Deutsch from Politico. Germany is now one of the countries leading this change for Brussels to have more power in health. And what will this mean, that there could also be a shift in Berlin's stance on health technology assessments? So, please. Well, okay. Uh, I uh, try to do all, all three uh, quickly. First of all, vaccines, what Mark just said. Uh, in, in general, I, I totally agree. Um, but we do right now uh, as a European Union and the member states of the European Union is actually two arms with the same goal. Uh, one arm is, uh, like we saw la last uh, weekend, uh, support CP, Gavi, ACT, the accelerator of the WHO, um, all the international efforts uh, to make it a, a, a global good, equitable access for all. Uh, but that means, uh, uh, needs upfront financing too. And at the same time, and you need to have acceptance, by the way, of your own citizens supporting international organizations uh, with billions, uh, to keep that acceptance, you need to make sure that at least at the same time as, uh, as through this arm you have a vaccine available, you have it available for your own citizens too. I find it very important because uh, if they should see that through our international engagement, there might be areas of the world that have it earlier than we have it ourselves, that would be a problem too for acceptance. Uh, and so what we want to make, uh, what we want to ensure is that at the same time, uh, uh, actually, uh, we, we, we get, uh, or we have it available uh, too. And I mean, available for the whole of Europe. There were concerns at the beginning uh, that countries like Germany with their economic strength uh, might uh, uh, go their way to secure vaccines. But we, uh, from the very beginning, to total, uh, together with, at the beginning, uh, the Netherlands, France and Italy, because that were the countries where the production capacities are. But with, with all now, uh, together and the Commission, at the, from the very beginning, we always made sure it's for the 27 and everyone will get the fair share uh, uh, proportional to the population and to nothing else. Uh, but we need to have both arms 
uh, both at the same time, same pricing, no doubt, uh, but that only keeps acceptance that I'm very um, convinced of. Uh, second, health sovereignty. I'm very much convinced. Only if you are sovereign yourself, you can really help others. And I would say that's a precondition for really being capable, uh, able, uh, when it comes to resources and when it comes to the acceptance of your own citizens uh, to help others and to engage in other areas of the world. Uh, so health sovereignty really just means that you are not dep too depending uh, uh, on, on, uh, on others uh, in, in, in times where we just see uh, in, in both directions but for different reasons and I never would call it equidistance by the way there are big differences but when you see the problems uh, that, that are there I mean with China we are too, too much uh, depending on two levels actually but that's a different story when it comes to products uh, uh, like like drugs APIs coming to Europe, but we are too depending too as for China as a market for cars, for example, or machines. Uh, it's not good for Europe and for Germany, especially as an export nation, that we are so much depending, and, and that it means uh, to really act as someone who is capable to help others on the world. Uh, you you need to have a kind of sovereignty, which does not mean that you are just it's Europe alone or Europe first or something. It just means uh, that you are strong enough to really uh, to really act uh, 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 sovereign. Uh, third question, which is a more special one, but a very European one, the HDR, the Health Tech uh, Technology Assessment, uh, which is one of the legal projects actually we take over from uh, pr previous uh, presidencies. Um, well, I, I can't promise if we if we manage to bring it through uh, in the upcoming six months, uh, because due to Corona, obviously uh, 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 the the agenda has shifted a bit. But nevertheless, uh, in general, uh, we are su uh, supportive. I mean, if it comes to the science approach of HDA, uh, if you have the same scientific framework, there should not be a different result in Riga, uh, Rome, uh, Amsterdam, or Madrid. It's actually the same. Uh, the question is, and that is where we actually have uh, different approaches or stances, as you want to name it, uh, is what does it mean for the coverage? What does it mean for the pricing? What does it mean for the national health system? So one thing is the HDA and the result of the HDA. Uh, and then the question is what follows out of it? Uh, and we want to have it less binding than others do. Uh, and that is actually where the debate is. Uh, I would say it's possible to find a compromise. It's only two or three articles. We are really, uh, uh, really having big differences, but we are moving towards each other. Even Parliament, Commission and, and, and Council are moving at the same time, more or less. So we, we will give it a try. Uh, but the truth is, with all the other issues on the table, cause of uh, Corona and, and lessons learned and, and uh, preparedness for the future, this is not the main uh, topic of our presidency, but it is one. Thank you. And we also saw in the poll that ECFR did that one of the conclusion is that there is a new progressive protectionism that is emerging and an appetite for Europe to control these value chains. But at the same time, we also know that there is a big debate about price and access to vaccines. And we keep having questions coming from, from ECFR council members and Patricia Sassnal is asking a little bit about, and it's a technical question about the, the dozens of consortia that are working around the vaccine. What should be, what should the European citizens know about how the money raised will be spent and how will you choose the big pharma company if there is a high probability that a capital will be ready at the same time? Should Europe choose a European company? Uh, and will you make sure that this company is not earning uh, money, making money on the vaccine? I think this is a lot of questions that people are asking. And it's also, of course, about equity and access globally, but equally also within the European Union. So this could be also something for you both to elaborate a little bit upon if you want. And we have also another question, if I may, and that's from Anya from the Robert Bush Foundation. What is your vision of an improved multilateral cooperation on global health? And I think this is something also that the minister touched upon. 
with the WHO and additionality. Uh, how do you prepare for a second wave together on each country to uh, to uh, to be on self again? So I didn't get it correctly, Anya, but I think what's interesting to know it's really how can the global multilateral response be better than we have seen so far? And perhaps also, Mark, if you would you mentioned that you are in an unhappy situation with being so prominent and important in global health, both with your soft power and uh, on global health policies, but equally also, of course, as one of the major donors, you have a lot of impact, perhaps without the same kind of accountability that the European institutions actually are holding. So this could perhaps also be something broad for both of you to elaborate a little bit upon and what's coming from council members. Please, shall we start with the uh, with Mark this time around? Is that okay with the minister? Always. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, Please, thank you. So, a couple of, of very good questions there. First is around the different vaccine consortia. So, there are over a hundred vaccines uh, currently being developed globally. We look at them very, very closely. We, we have a, a strong um, infectious disease and epidemiologist is sort of within our resources and we have a, a long history of partnering with the global pharmaceutical industry for diseases that disproportionately affect the poor and so we've been looking at these and tracking these very closely uh, we're co-funding some of them through CEPI in our view there are about a dozen or so that you know very plausibly uh, could be successful the good news about this vaccine is is people unlike say regular flu or HIV we're pretty confident there will be a successful vaccine uh, hopefully in a relatively short period of time, but we don't know which. And so again, it, what it does is it makes sense for the European Commission, it makes sense for uh, the United States, it makes sense for, for others to be funding multiple uh, tools at the same time, consortium at the same time, where we're even starting manufacturing and commitments to manufacturing relatively early. Even if some of them don't work, it means we'll be able to get them out at scale exactly where the minister was talking about to ensure that European citizens are going to get access uh, to a vaccine as soon as we don't want to wait for a phase three trial and then start. It, it takes a long time to start manufacturing hundreds of millions or billions of doses in complicated bioreactors. So in fact, we're in live discussions right now uh, with a number of countries um, and with the commission itself about whether there are kind of partnerships where we might use our own capital as the Gates Foundation, where our mandate is really to help uh, work for the very poorest countries, the least developed countries, where we might do a joint deal with some of these consortia where there's uh, the bulk of European resources are going towards uh, ensuring European citizens get that access, because I completely agree with the minister, you need that first. It would be uh, very strange if uh, European money was funding vaccines to be elsewhere first. But I think you can be both and, and you know, you can leverage partners like us uh, to do that. And what that does is it drives down the costs because you can you know, make pooled money and resourcing. You can, uh, again, many of these uh, pharmaceutical companies have said they do not intend to make a profit, but they don't yet full know their costs. Um, and so they do want cost recovery, even if they don't want to make a profit. And so we need to give them clarity on what those markets would be and what the terms would be. And uh, so I think what we're trying to do is do many of these in parallel. And you don't necessarily look for national champions. You look at what the best science is, uh, and then you look for the partners. Uh, but some of the partnerships absolutely should and could be focused on European needs. Uh, in terms of the wider multilateral response and how do you get ready for the potential second wave, I think we're learning all the time. Uh, so already, uh, even if uh, there are challenges globally, and it's important to realize that the biggest trend lines or the worst trend lines at the moment are in Latin America and South Asia, and we worry soon in sub-Saharan Africa as well. And so you do need to think of that global response as well as the national responses in terms of potential upcoming second waves. That needs a combination of global leadership, you know, stronger leadership from the WHO and those uh, linked partnerships. And that's exactly what the ACTA accelerator that the European leaders have been pushing for is helping do. It provides a coordinating platform to ensure that all these different health agencies are cooperating against specific objectives against vaccines, diagnostics, therapeutics, which are the treatments. And so I think that's underway and that's important to continue and, and make sure is fully resourced if we are going to uh, make sure that there isn't a, a significant rebound. Thank you. 
And, and Minister, we are, we are about 10 minutes until we end, but it's also the first time that the uh, ECFR's annual council meeting is alive. And we also have a question from Twitter and around health sovereignty. May I also put that because this is putting a lot of interest from, from um, our audience. This is from uh, Dario from Fletteren. Uh, how would you define essential drugs and medtech production, which is su sufficient to reshore back to Europe? And where lies the good grade of globalization? Well, I, I will get back to that uh, immediately. Just two remarks on WHO and international cooperation for the second wave. Okay. I mean, it's about sharing experience, sharing knowledge, sharing resources. And that is actually what we do through WHO. And we have seen from the beginning, actually, WHO can only be as good as member states or, or participating states. Uh, let, let it be. Uh, if, if the information is not given to WHO, if it is not shared, uh, it's it's very hard to to cooperate, and it's very hard for an international organization that is so much depending, obviously, uh, on on information uh, from the ground uh, to 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 act. Um, uh, what we have decided in the federal government is we have we have. Uh, uh, demands actually from all over the world to support, for example, technical support, masks, uh, ventilators and others. Uh, and, and we will channel most of it through WHO because we think it's better uh, them to decide where it goes uh, 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 than, than us. Of course, there are some bi bilateral activities, but most of it will be channeled through WHO to make sure uh, uh, that, uh, that it is a, m a more neutral uh, way uh, to 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 uh, and a way that secures that it is going to the countries that need it most uh, actually um when it comes to uh, health serenity and the right degree as i <laughs> named it of globalization that is to be discussed uh, frankly spoken i have not yet uh, the final answer but i have the questions uh, we have re already brought this question up uh, last year twice in the council in, in Strasbourg, I, I guess it was, uh, uh, we already brought it up together with other countries and asked the commission and others to, to develop a, a common strategy for pharmaceutical uh, products uh, and medical devices. Uh, and now finally, we are really uh, speeding, uh, speeding this up because uh, the, the general need uh, is accepted, but, and the question is totally right, you of course need to define it good, but to, I, I really want to make sure I, it's not about protectionism uh, and, and, and stopping globalization uh, uh, totally. And of course, there's, uh, there's a value in, in this work sharing that we have all over the world. But nevertheless, and even if it is about pricing, of course, it is, it's cheaper or less expensive, put it as you want to, uh, but what does it less expensive drug help if there is no supply uh, and if it is not there when you need it. Uh, and that is what we have experienced in the past in the past uh, years, actually, uh, that uh, some and then we need to define essential drugs, ICU drugs, for example, that we, we needed in this crisis were not available, uh, at least not uh, not enough of it. And then we bought API and asked German universities actually to produce what was needed. But it was very hard to get that API and it was very expensive too. Uh, but that is not the way it should be. Uh, and so we, we should define and uh, that needs to be defined carefully. I totally agree, but it needs to be defined. What are the areas where we want to have at least additional production uh, back uh, in Europe and back in Europe does not per se, by the way, mean in Germany. I mean, Europe and European Union and all parts of it. So it could be a good combination, by the way, of the economic recovery program we are doing uh, combined with this need um, that we that we are about to define uh, and to say, let's use it to, uh, to, to build up production uh, of certain products in certain areas of Europe. Uh, but then, uh, last, uh, last thought, then you need to make sure that in a crisis like this, the border within Europe for goods remains open. Because if you do this uh, as a European Union uh, and we decide to have a production of this certain API uh, in, in, in one country, of course, uh, it should not come to the situation that that, that country is closing uh, the borders uh, then when it comes to a crisis and then there is no 
then uh, it makes no sense. Uh, but but in general, that is actually the debate we need to have. What is the right degree and what are these es essential products? I only can give some examples so far, but I want to have that debate. And as far as I know, here are many think tanks uh, part of this debate here. So if you have good idea ideas around this, we are very happy uh, uh, to take them and to work with them. Thank you so much, Minister Spahn. And no doubt that the ECFR is really onto this because it's a very interesting discussion from a European perspective with health sovereignty and how European Union together works with innovation, financing, and of course, intellectual property. And it's, it's, it's a big issue, but I'm really happy that we could start the discussion here. Uh, it will for sure continue. I think we also heard very good things and the hopeful things from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation around from its CEO, Mark Zusman, around the need for vaccines and the tireless work for having consortium globally to find that and that there might be no um, there might be no problem that we have health sovereignty in Europe and at the same time embracing globalization cooperation and fighting for the multilateral institutions. I heard you both saying that WHO and other uh, international organizations are not stronger than the different member states. Uh, they need to be financed and European Union is of course with all its different member states also playing a very, very crucial role in this time to also show for global solidarity and believe in the multilateral systems. I think that uh, this is um, a, a very good start for us also at ECFR and the Council. There is a uh, there is a need, I think, now with a global health strategy in European Union that will be started off and matured during the leadership of Minister Jens Spahn during the German presidency, but also that there is a ECFR paper on health sovereignty uh, that is also part of this discussion going on. So I thank you. And I don't know if, if any of you would like to have a, a 20 seconds uh, before we, we wrap up the session, as I promised to be on time in, the, uh, in ending up this. But I would like to thank both of you for taking your time for show leadership and uh, trust that ECFR will be highly committed in this broad aspect that needs to, to uh, be, be taken forward. Uh, Mark, CEO of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, anything you would like to add? Uh, just to thank you, Canil, to you and the ECFR. These are critical questions, and Europe is playing a absolutely critical role. And the next six months of the German presidency, I would argue, are going to actually set the global parameters uh, for what is likely to be many, many years to come in this space. And so uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation looks forward to being a, a continued strong and active partner to both Germany, the EC, the ECFR, uh, because this is a global need and uh, we uh, hope we can be part of that global response. Thank you. Thanks for that and for your leadership. And dear Minister Jens Spahn from, from Germany, it's a, it's a huge undertaking now and a lot of expectations on your leadership and Germany during this presidency in these very difficult times. We wish you good well, luck. I Thank you. I see the expectations uh, and that again makes us makes me more humble than overconfident because I know how big these expectations are, not just for health, but for uh, 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 the MFF as well, uh, or MFR in English uh, as well uh, as, as for other topics. Um, but we want to uh, succeed uh, together with all our uh, uh, colleagues and the other member states and uh, the, uh, the, the institutions and parliament and commission in Brussels. So um, we've, we are very grateful for every idea. And as I just mentioned, uh, ECFR and others, we are very happy uh, uh, or would welcome every in input we get, every good thought that is out there. Uh, it's, it's always good to see or to get to know all the different point of views. So thank you very much for this debate. And even more, if there are some ideas around, uh, please don't hesitate. Thank you so much. We will come back. And thanks for everyone joining this conversation, listening in and following ECFR's annual council meeting. We will now end for today. Stay tuned, come back tomorrow morning, 10.30 European time and follow our discussions and our annual meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minister Spahn. Thank you, CEO Mark Sussman. And um, good luck. Have a nice evening here in Europe. Bye bye. Thank you.
are here to learn from each other, to exchange information.